everyone, welcome to another It's Live live show. It's so nice that you're here and we're ready to get started just on time. I'm never late, except that I am a little bit late. A little bit late, but pretty good, considering everything just fell apart before things started. <laughs> but I think everything's together now. Hopefully you can see me, hopefully you can hear me, and hopefully you still feel that way by the end of this live show. Well, first of all, let's go through a few rudimentary things that we always do at the beginning of the live show. I have a few little announcements. First of all, this live show comes out every second Wednesday, except when it doesn't and it hasn't been for a little while. I know, I know things, have, the schedule's been a little, little off, but you can actually uh, see our schedule and what our plans, are, <laughs> our intended plans are by going to Watch It Played. I'm actually just bring it up here for you. I'll bring it up for you in a second. Watch It Played. Dot TV. Now, hopefully here in a second, I'm going to be able to switch you over to see this. Hopefully you're seeing it now. This is the watchitplay.tv website, and you'll see on here the schedule for September, for example. And look at this right here. We're doing a live show on the 9th, and it's actually happening. Incredibly, it is, it is happening. And we do try to update this if the live show changes. In theory, we, we will update the... Uh, the schedule, except that we often don't. But the, the intention is that we will. We're, we're going to get better at this. Watch It Played has never been on a schedule before. So it's a, it's a learning process. We're going to get better with it over time. Uh, so I wanted to mention that. The other thing is if you want to ask a question during this live show. Now, sometimes during the live shows, I have some wacky things going on. There's not going to be as much wacky stuff going on. We've got so many questions that have piled up from live episode after live episode after live episode that this one, I want to really focus on your questions. And I have a few that were from the Board Game Geek Guild that people were asking that I've queued up here that I want to go through as well. And of course, all yours here in the live chat. So if you do want to ask a question, here is the way you do it. In the comments, write QUESTION in all caps, colon, and then you just write out your question. And that way, Andrea, my daughter who is, is watching the chat and keeping an eye on it, she will look for those questions, fish them out, and queue them up for me so I can answer them for you. And I just want to say a quick congratulations for, to Andrea. She has officially graduated from university. A big achievement. Well done, Andrea. Well done, everyone. Yes, yes. Very nice, Andrea. And now she's graduated and she's monitoring comments for her dad. <laughs> well, that graduation's been put well to use. <laughs> no, Andrea's also looking for work and, and hoping to be gainfully employed uh, soon. And she is, she's doing some current work, some internship, and she's hoping to do some other work as well. Anyway, uh, let's move on, shall we? Oh, before we get into like your questions, there is one little thing that I, I did want to mention. Oh, <laughs> before I mention that, though, I first have to mention that we have a sponsor for the live show. Let's talk about our sponsor for the live show, shall we? Sure, sure we shall. Boy, it's been a little while since I've done this, hasn't it? Let me see if I can find our, our sponsor here to bring up on screen. Do you remember who our sponsor is? That's right, it's Board Game Arena. Board Game Arena is our, our sponsor, and uh, they're going to take you over to their website right now and show you a couple of the... Let me see if I've got this done right. I don't even know I'm doing this. Whoa, that's, that's all wrong. <laughs> Here we go. This should be right. You should be seeing Santorini available now. So Board Game Arena is always putting out uh, new games that you can play with your friends remotely. And Santorini is one of the new games that they've released, a very popular game. Let me just see if I can bring up the control panel here for it. Yeah. And you can actually see, if you look down here in this little window, you can see a little video kind of transparently playing here. And what's kind of cool about Santorini is it uses a lot of 3D components, right? And a lot of the board game arena games don't really have those 3D elements, but this one does. You'll see you have your 3D little pieces dropping in here. So you can play Santorini online with other players. They also have another game that they released recently. Let's see, which one is it? I think it's Yo yeah, Yokohama released recently as well. Another popular game from Tasty Minstrel Games. And they have that queued up. Now this game, I haven't played it before. I read the rules to it. Uh, it looked really interesting, but I imagine it takes up a big space on your table. Well, not here. It just takes up a big space on your screen instead. So those are two new games on here. And one of the things that I always say about uh, Board Game Arena that I really appreciate is that they license all of their games with the publishers. So they aren't just sort of doing it behind the scenes and creating this on their own platform. They do this in partnership with the publishers. So it's supported by the publishers as well, which I think is great. So thank you again, Board Game Arena, for helping to sponsor this show. And also, if you'd like to help support the show during the show or any other time, we have a couple of ways you can do that. There is the Watch It Played shelf poster, which should be linked to in the description below. We also have our Teespring store where you can order Teesprings and coffee mugs. I just saw someone post on Twitter just before the live show went live that they'd picked up the Watch It Played mug. And I have to say, of all, there's different colors, but I think white might be the best one because 
although there you can get like say a, a color like purple. I, I got the purple one. The color of the band purple wraps mostly around the hand, the the cup, but then it stops at the handle, so it doesn't make the whole mug purple. If you know what I'm saying. Whereas the white just kind of all blends in. So I think that one might be the nicest looking one. But try a different color if you want. There's t-shirts, there's hoodies and things like that. And of course we have our Pod Pledge promos that you can pick up in our Pod Pledge store. And you can give tips during uh, the live show. There's like a little super chat th function. There's a little dollar sign there if you'd like to ask a question and donate to the show while you do it. Feel free and I'll try to get to your questions during this show. Okay, so there was one thing I wanted to mention. Notice here uh, today I'm wearing just a black t-shirt. Normally I'm wearing some kind of plaid shirt usually. Uh, well, I'm not, I, I, I do have something I'm going to put on here. How do I explain this? Um, okay, so last month I was invited to be a host on the Lion Rampant dr Distribution Virtual Open House. <laughs> that's a mouthful, isn't it? Basically, they're a distribution company for board games that's located here in Canada, and normally they would have uh, a, a, an event where they'd invite publishers and retailers and potentially designers to come. It's, a, it's sort of an industry insider thing, but they would invite them to come so retailers could take a look at some of the new games coming out in the new year and decide what things they might want to order and possibly even place some orders there at the event. Well, obviously with COVID-19, that uh, event was canceled, so it went virtual and they asked me and Mandy Hutchinson from Dice Tower uh, to be a part of that and host different days. Now, Mandy hosted one day, I hosted a day, and then she hosted the other day. It was like a Rodney sandwich there, <laughs> kind of. Um, anyway, on one of the days, she posted her picture uh, before she went live. And let me show, actually, I have it here. I'll show it to you. Look at Mandy. Look how stunning she looked. I mean, she had the sparkle. She had the bling. I could not compete with that. I was just, I was blown away. I was totally wowed. And I, I tried on my day to put on something a little fancy, but I just, I couldn't pull something together in time. So I thought for this live show, I would glamorize myself for the live show. So I have got... Over here, something that I'm hoping can compete, compete with the wonderful Mandy Hutchinson. Let's, let's see. I'll have to maybe tweet this out to her later. Oh, dear. Some stuff is falling on the ground. That's not supposed to happen. Here, one second. I'm almost... Just give me a minute. Give me a minute here. I'll be, be right... Oh, sorry for the mic noise. There's probably going to be a little bit of scuffing. Okay. Here we go. Check this out. Check this out. I've got... I've, I've, be, I've bedazzled myself. Uh, can you... Can you t Okay, this is not, so a couple of them fell off there when I was putting the shirt on. Um, so this is my attempt. Wow, this is, a, this is my first time putting it on. This is, uh, I think I, no, I think Mandy still got the title. Let, let's, let's check though, let's check. Mandy and this. No, Mandy's got it, Mandy <laughs> still got it. You know, it's, it's a lot harder to stick these little stickers on than I thought it would be. It was very difficult to get them even. It took... And you know what, maybe I shouldn't have tried to do this like 10 minutes before the live show. That might be part of the reason why I'm late. I was trying to bedazzle myself. Oh dear. I guess, well, I'll keep this on. I've, I've worn it after. I don't think this would survive a trip through the washing machine though. I think every one of these would pop off. I think if I breathe too heavy, these things are going to pop off. You know what? Let's move on and get to your questions and just kind of forget that this happened. I don't know how we'll forget exactly, but... Let's look at one of the questions. So this is one of the questions we got from the Watch It Played Board Game Geek Guild. And before I actually go into this question, I'm going to see if, if Andrea has any important notes to me. She keeps little notes in case like the audio cuts out, if, like maybe the bedazzling just blinded everyone. I don't know. No, it looks like we're, we're, we're good. So I'll move on to the first question. This is from Coral Lee L who asks, which is more frustrating in a rule book? Missing information or a typo changing the meaning? Well, you've given me only two options here, right? I, I think there's other things that are, are frustrating to me in, in rule books as well. But between these two options, Corley, I would say missing information by far. Typos can be frustrating, especially when they do change the meaning. And, and I have seen that happen in rule books before. But a typo is, you know, it's forgivable in its own way because a typo is not something, in, well, an editor should pick up on it. But if it's one of those typos where the word's spelled right, but it's just the wrong <laughs> word, you know what I mean? Uh, that can be a problem. Whereas missing information, there's not much you can do about that. Sometimes like a, a mistyped rule, you can deduce what they meant. But if it's not there, you don't know what you don't know. And that can be very, very frustrating. Uh, so, and I, I think also it shows a little bit of, it shows a lack of, uh, 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 certain steps being followed during the rule writing process, I think. Because if you blind play test your game, and you give them, uh, the people who've never played your game before the rule book, 
pretty soon they should uncover that problem. Uh, or at the very least, you should see them having that problem with the rules, and then you'd be able to go in and correct it. But I think that blind playtesting step often gets skipped, unfortunately. Um, you know, there's a, I had an example here as well of another sort of rulebook frustration I have. It's with the dual rulebook systems. I don't mean to pick on FFG, but they do, they're big proponents of the dual rulebook system. I've been playing uh, Marvel Champions and really enjoying it. And for the most part, the rulebook books are fine. But the problem is when you split them into these two formats, Learn to play. This is the one you read when you want to learn to play. And then if you have questions, you look them up in here. The problem is when the question you have isn't in here under the heading that you would think it would be, and you're scouring the index and you're not seeing it there. Like, for example, one of the actions that you can take when you're playing is to ask. You can ask a player to do something for you. So they have options. Change form in bold. Another option, play in bold. Another option, use in bold. So these are keywords they've bolded and said these are actions you can take. One of them is called ask. So I was wondering about the limitations on the ask action. What can you ask an opponent to do? Well, maybe there'll be a greater elaboration of that in here. So I went looking under, what do you think I would look under? Ask, right? No, there's no heading called ask in here. And I think if you're going to do these dual rulebook systems, you've either got to be like, I don't know, you've got to be really on the ball about imagining the sort of questions that people are going to ask so you can put relevant headings for them to look up. Or you've got to put that relevant information in the Learn to Play guide. I, I always feel like I'd rather just have everything all in one anyway. I don't really like the dual rulebook system, but I understand part of the attractiveness of it is that you can sort of thin down your rulebook. You can make your Learn to Play guide feel a little lighter so the game's not so overwhelming. But I don't like digging around looking for things where I think they should be and not finding them. Well, I really went on a little tear about that one, didn't I? Let's go to another question. <laughs> Maybe one that will upset me less. This one's from Todd Adair. It says, what is a niche thing you miss from conventions and gaming groups during this COVID period? Who? what is a niche thing you miss? Um, you know, it's, like, it's difficult because it's the broad things I think of first, right? The friendships, meeting up with friends that I, honestly, there's so many people I've met through this hobby and particularly through these convention experiences, that that's the only place I get to see them. And I'm sure that's true for a lot of people who've attended conventions. Oftentimes you'll go there and you'll meet some people and they become your friends and then to the time you're going to see them again is the next convention and all of us have been missing that. I mean, there's lots of things <laughs> not to miss about conventions too. You know, lineups for the bathroom, uh, terrible men's bathrooms. <laughs> you know, there's lots of things to not miss about conventions. But I mean, the biggest things are, are the friends. I think that's, that's the biggest thing I miss. There is something to be said a little bit about the spectacle of a convention too. It's very exciting to be a part of an event where a whole bunch of people are coming together who all share your same passion. Maybe that's the niche thing I would identify because that may, might not be as obvious, but it's pretty wonderful. I, I especially have this experience when I go to places like Aircon or BGGCon or BGG Spring because they have these big open rooms where most people are gathered to game. And you will get your head buried into a game, your brain's sweating trying to make right decisions, and you'll look up from this experience you're having at the table, and you look around, and as far as the eye can see, there's people playing games with their heads down, with them sweating over what decisions they're going to make next, or laughing with a friend, or whatever might be going on. And in that moment, it's quite a wonderful thing to realize that you share this sort of hobby DNA with all these different people. And that's a, that's a pretty special feeling, especially because our hobby itself is still very niche overall. So, yeah, there you go, Todd. That's my, that's my answer on, on that one. And don't forget, if you have questions, if you're watching right now and you're asking questions in the comments, don't worry. I'm going to get to your questions as well. We're going to make this a very question and answer focused episode. But I just want to try to go through some of these ones that have been sitting here week after week uh, from the Board Game Geek Guild and from other YouTube uh, live shows that I haven't gotten to. So, Jesse Rodeaver writes, did you ever pursue games for your show? At what point was it no longer necessary? Okay, so Jesse, I think here is asking, you know, for the games that we feature on the channel, uh, do I have to go out and petition publishers, hey, would you be interested in hiring me for this tutorial video? Or do they, you know, come to me now and I, don't, I can sort of just sit back and, and let the game sort of wash over me? Well, um, let's answer the first question first. Yes, I certainly did pursue games. I, I still do. Sometimes I'll see a game and I'll think, wow, that looks really intriguing. Uh, I'll try to like read a pass of the rules and go, yeah, okay, this one looks like one I'd be very interested in showing, and then I'll, I'll reach out to the publisher. In the early days, of course, um, 
publishers didn't know who I was or what Watch It Played was or if it would have any value to them. So uh, definitely I was, I was po mostly petitioning publishers at that time. I think the first time I ever did it was a little prematurely. It was after I'd finished my first Mansions of Madness first edition playthrough and I was feeling very high off of the experience of having done that playthrough. I really enjoyed doing it. People seemed to enjoy watching it. And I'd done it start to finish. It was like 20 some odd episodes. I, it was a lot of episodes, right? And when I was done, I felt like I want to keep doing this. I really feel like this is tapping into, I don't know, a, a bit of a skill set I have, but also something I'm really finding fulfilling. So <laughs> I wrote Fantasy Flight Games because I mentioned Madness is their game. And I said, hey, I did this series, check it out. I would love to do more of your games. Would you ever want to like send some of them to me? And I would feature them. Like at this point, I wasn't asking for payment. I was just like, maybe you'd send a game or two and I would, would consider teaching them on the show. And I got a very kind, uh, kindly worded no <laughs> written back to me in, in more nuance that, than that. But effectively, it was like, no, that's not a partnership we're looking for. And that was probably one of the best things that could have ever happened. Because uh, I remember at the time, I did not take offense to the response. It was kind of like a nice little splash of, of cold water, like, right, Rodney, you, you did 20 episodes of a thing. Why would anyone think you're going to keep doing this? You know, I could just be like another flash in the pan type of thing. So if I want to build those relationships with publishers, I need to keep working and prove that I'm going to be around here for months to come. And if I keep doing that, maybe someday, you know, they'll want to work with me. And it was really a beautiful kind of full circle when, when uh, they hired me on to do Mansions of Madness second edition. So, you know, I think, yes, publishers still reach out to me and, and want to work with me, which is a wonderful thing uh, and a wonderful place to be in. But I, I'm so thankful for those years where that wasn't the case. And I had to sort of, you know, build up the channel and, and keep working on it and build my relationship with you folks as, as viewers as well. Uh, so that you would want to keep coming back and being a part of this community and hopefully have something valuable to offer to you and to publishers and, and hopefully to this industry in some way. So there you go, uh, Jesse, that is, <laughs> that is the answer to that question. Next question, Adam Hostetler asks, how does your approach change when teaching for video versus teaching in person? Well, the biggest change is that when I'm teaching for video, I have a script. I would, if I'm, if I'm teaching a game today, I would go through, uh, in the case of one of these systems where there's two rule books, I'd go through both rule books, oops, over here, both rule books and rewrite everything into what I would feel would be a better organization of the information for video. Something that fits sort of my style and hopefully makes it as succinct as, succinct as possible. And I, after the, the script is written, I'll go over it a couple of times and keep refining and refining. So that is a big difference. You know, sometimes people will, will leave nice comments on the videos and, and say, um, nice things about my teaching style or whatever. But keep in mind, I have a script with me. So if you're teaching, you're like, man, I can't teach like Rodney. I can't teach like Rodney, okay? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, now when I am preparing to teach in person with people, that said, I do put, a, I, I try to put quite a bit of effort into it. I will read the rule book again, cover to cover. I won't rely on my memory, unless it's a game I know really, really well. Even still though, I will go to the rule book and I will flip through it and I'll double check, are there any little, little rules here I might miss? And I will try to think through what is the best presentation style. And if I can, if I have the time, and most of us do have the time, we just don't take it, I will do a practice run when no one's around. I'll just talk out loud, just like I'm talking to you out loud right now, and I will see, do I have the flow? Am I tripping over my words? Am I forgetting things? If I am, good, because I'd rather make that mistake when no one's around than make it while people are trying to pay attention, if that makes sense. So there you go, Adam. It's, it's different in terms of how much I have to prepare, but I think whether you're doing it in a video or live in front of people, preparation goes a long way to making the teach better. Jackie writes, what are your top three fun facts about PEI. So if you don't know what PEI is, that stands for Prince Edward Island and that's where I live here in Canada. I, <laughs> I think there are three, I don't know if they're like sort of facts about the island. I mean, they're kind of facts about the island, but there's sort of three, three things that I think of when I think of the island. When we first moved here, I think this is probably true of lots of small towns. If I would ask for directions, as one does when they're new somewhere, I would often get answers like, oh, you're trying to find uh, Frank Jones's house. <laughs> I don't know of any Frank Joneses that live here. 
Uh, yeah, you need to go, uh, okay, go down the street, turn right at the purple house, turn, and then go, go a kilometer or two, turn left at, at Miller's gas station, then, uh, and, you know, at some point after they've gone through about six or seven steps, I go, well, yeah, I understand that. Do you have his address? He's a friend of yours, right? Yeah, yeah, he's a friend of mine. You have his address? No, I, I'm not sure. You don't know the, the street or the house number? No, no, I'm not sure. But if you just go down, turn at the Purple House, turn at the Miller's Gas Station, go up the hill, go down the hill, turn. And it turns out Miller's Gas Station burnt down like 10 years ago, of course, and isn't actually there. <laughs> but, but for the locals, that's, that's Miller's Gas Station. Uh, that was one thing I noticed, because coming from the city, it was always like, you know, you just gave someone the address, they punched into their phone, and off, off you went. The other thing I noticed is that when you first would meet people, you would also often get asked, who's your mother, who's your father? People wanted to know who your parents were. Because if they knew your parents, they could probably figure out other connections within the community, because again, the community is so small. And that's something else. I, I remember early on, when I was starting to make relationships here, I would run into people I knew later and they go, I saw you on the street the other day, I waved and you didn't wave back. There's a lot of, you didn't wave back, kind of accusations flying around in my direction. And I was like, when, when, when did you, you were driving by me? I wouldn't, I wouldn't have noticed you. Did you honk? No, I didn't honk, I just waved. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And I realized in smaller communities, people are so used to seeing people they know that they're always looking for people they know. They're looking in the street. They're looking to see who's driving by because odds are they're going to know somebody and they'll just wave at them, right? Uh, whereas, again, you live in the city, you don't expect to run to anyone that you know hardly ever, right? So that was, that was interesting. I like that about the small town too, though. One of the things when we were renting in a, in a more isolated area than even where I am now, it's a little more off the grid and a common tradition, if someone's driving down the street by your home, you wave at them, they wave at you. No exception. You always wave. And I love the forced friendliness of that. Because even though it was sort of like, well, I better do this, doing nice things, whether you're sort of doing them for forced reasons or not, kind of rubs off on you a little bit. And you do kind of feel like, hey, neighbor, you know, it just kind of like works into your system a little bit. So I like that. Uh, the other thing, and maybe I'm past three now, Jackie, I don't know, you're getting a bonus one here. Um, coming from away, if you didn't live on the island, but you moved here, then you were known as coming from away. I'm sure this is true of other places as well, but it meant in the eyes of some islanders, you would never be an islander. Even your children might not be considered islanders. Their children maybe would be considered islanders, but you will always be from away. So there you go. There's a few PEI facts for you. James Wood asks, what are the advantages and disadvantages to these digital alternatives for conventions? Oh, James, interesting question, yeah. So in this new world right now where we have COVID-19 running wild and conventions shut down, the alternative has been for some of these convention organizers to run virtual conventions. We've had virtual BGG cons, we've had virtual, or well, we almost had virtual origins until it got canceled. We've had virtual Gen Con, we've had, we will be having virtual Spiel, Virtual UK Games Expo just happened, I think. <sighs> advantages and disadvantages. Well, it's difficult not to dwell on the disadvantages because conventions are such a unique experience, and oftentimes for people who go, quite a powerful experience, that a virtual one just can't really shine a candle to it. But, I mean, for example, again, you can't meet your friends in person. You can just see them over Skype or whatever. Well, again, I could just do that any old day. So you, you miss that. You miss kind of the fervor of the crowds. Now, some people don't like crowds, so that can be a positive for some people. But if you like that excitement, that social atmosphere, then that's, that's certainly missing. Also, when you're at a convention, you can kind of control where you're going and what you see. In a virtual convention, sometimes you don't have those same kind of options. Maybe it's a streaming video that you have to watch. Maybe there's two or three different channels running at once, which I think was true for Gen Con. So you have three options kind of at any one time. Whereas at a convention, if I want to go to the FFG booth, I can just go to the FFG booth. You know, so, so that's, that's, those are some disadvantages. But there are many advantages, too. First of all, a lot of people can't go to a convention. They just can't. It's too cost prohibitive. It's too expensive. They've got to fly somewhere. So a virtual convention is arguably much more open to a, a greater number of people. So that's kind of a nice advantage to it. If there's a video component to the uh, convention, which there often is, then that will sort of exist beyond the convention time. So if you're not able to watch it on the day, you might be able to watch it and sort of participate in that event later. 
So there are some positives, but I just think it still lacks that feeling that I think a lot of people are seeking when they think about going to a convention. So I actually saw uh, there's a magic convention that's going to be happening. Uh, not Magic the Gathering, like magic for magicians. Uh, next month, I think. And the, the way that's going to work is you're going to have a little avatar that exists in a 3D world. Well, sort of a 3D world. But the, the point is, you're going to have a little pixel, uh, pixel char pixelated character, and you can walk around the convention effectively. And when you walk near somebody, I believe the audio of them will get a little louder. They'll pop up on your screen. You can interact with them. You can walk away from them. You can go over to a booth. And you can interact with the magician who's there. You can potentially buy some product from them. They can demo a trick to you or whatever the case may be. So I think it's interesting because I think this might attempt to mimic in some way that social component that is missing from a lot of these online conventions. And that I don't know if it'll work. I don't know if I'm going to attend or not, but I, I'm intrigued by the idea. All right, so let's uh, see what Tom Heddington has to say. How do you deal with the same commenters that's commenters commenters that seem to be just continually grumpy. Well, I don't have any commenters who are continually grumpy, but that's partly because um, I am pretty strict about just blocking people who are showing a mean-spiritedness to what they're saying. If someone comes into a video and says, I don't really care for this game, it's not really to my liking, that's no problem. If somebody comes in and goes, I don't really like the way you presented this game, I, I think your teaching style is not for me, that's fine. If somebody comes in and says something nasty or mean, does name calling, makes very strong declarative statements that this is the way it is and no other opinion counts, this is clearly a terrible and stupid game, this is dumb, I don't know why you'd ever cover it, something like that, I just, I just block them. And the thing is with YouTube, they don't know they've been blocked, which is kind of the beauty of it. Uh, I will never engage, uh, never? Maybe on, on one hand, have I ever engaged. If it's somebody who I've seen in the comments before and I feel like, well, this is odd, this is odd for them, I might engage in that, in that situation, but most of the times I won't. I'll just block, they can keep posting, they'll never show up in the uh, comments and um, I'll never see them again. Because I'm not really interested in just constant chatter. I want positive, uplifting chatter, <laughs> if that makes sense. I want people who come in to the comments of the videos to find a friendly and inviting place where, yes, you can have a diversity of opinions, but you need to know how to be civil about it and to be nice about it. And yes, that means I have to sort of be subjective because what I think is nice and not nice is going to be up to my opinion, but it's my channel. So I, I take my liberties there. And it's a similar thing on social media. Uh, sometimes I will engage there, but it depends. I try not to for the most part. Uh, the thing that will typically get me to engage is when someone says something critical about one of my friends or someone that I like, I find it harder to resist in those situations. Uh, but if it's directed at me, I don't care. <laughs> like, I really don't care. Um, and I'm not just saying that. It's not just a thick skin thing. Early on when I created the channel, I created a rule for myself. And the rule was that when someone's being negative towards me, I have to remember, I don't know who this person is. I don't know where they're at in their life. This could be, a, this could be an eight-year-old. This could be a uh, 95 year old. This could be, I have no idea. I have no idea if there's a language barrier. I don't know if they're having just a terrible mental day. They could have been just fired from their job. Maybe their wife just left. They could be having the worst day of their life and they're expressing it in this way. Have I ever said things I regret? Yes. I mean, I've gotten angry, lost my cool, blown off my handle, and afterwards just wish I had not said it. So are other people capable of that? Certainly. But I don't typically, so I just try not to take it on board. You know, if someone's upset with me, I'm okay. I've, I'm happy with my life. I'll be fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not, it's not the end of the world that, that someone out there doesn't like me. And that, that's the, the compulsion we have, I think, sometimes when we get negative commentary is to imagine that other person as a peer, to imagine them like your mother or father saying it to you or your friend. And of course, on that level, then it would be devastating maybe to have someone say those words to you. But if it's somebody who doesn't really know you or have an investment in you as a person, I don't, I don't know why I would put a lot of weight on that, you know? Um, so that's, that's how I, I deal with it. Um, I try very much, like, I, I do hear other creators say, you know, you have 25 great comments and then, or 200 great comments and then that one negative comment, that one negative comment just sticks with you forever. I'm very fortunate. Whatever, like, whatever nerve ending that is, I don't have it. I don't pay attention to that one comment. I pay attention to the 200 nice comments. And I sort of react according to that. If the 200 comments, 
nice comments start to shift and be like, oh, well, then maybe there's something I need to worry about here. But if it's just a couple of people being nasty, I just, well, I don't know, I just don't take it on board. Um, okay, so that's, uh, <laughs> hopefully that answers your question, Tom. And we are almost done. There's two more questions from the prior audience, and then we're going to get to your questions, the people who are watching right now. Although I know some of these questions did come from, from some of you originally. Ebo Eklafekan writes, I really enjoy your appearances on Game Night. What is that process like? Actually, <laughs> Ebo wrote a much longer question. I really enjoy your appearances on Game Night and was wondering if you could explain a little of how it all works. How many different game run-throughs do you film per visit? How long do you visit? And do you stay with Lincoln and Nikki during your trip? How is it decided what games you play? And how much notice do you get to prepare rules explanations? Do you play any of the games more than once off camera? Whew. Well, let me see if I can try to answer this. I mean, this is really, the Game Night show is run by BGG and, and Lincoln and Nikki, so I don't think I'm speaking at a turn on, I, by talking about some of these things. But uh, let me see, how, how does it all work? Well, we, we, we do talk in advance about what games we might want to feature. Uh, do I know all of them before we go live? No, not always. Um, sometimes, I mean, they try to create a very authentic Game Night experience. So oftentimes one person at the table actually knows the rules, like in a typical game night, and everyone else is just learning from that person. So when you're watching and learning the rules, so are most of the other people at the table. Now sometimes people will have played the game in advance, but uh, not always. The person teaching usually has. So that's one thing. Uh, how many will we record during a visit? I mean, because I live on the exact opposite side of the continent and in a different country, when I go, we try to pack in a bunch, like, like six to eight, something like that. We do at least two a day, sometimes we've done three a day, that can be a long day. That can be a long day because you, you're trying, I mean, I always feel very self-conscious of when I'm making a video, the point is you haven't been sitting there for 12 hours. <laughs> you're fresh. So if I'm looking run down, that's out of sync with what your experience should be. I should be just as lively as if game three is the first game I'm playing that day. That's my sensibility around it. So. Um, you know, you just, you want to try to stay elevated and energized during that whole process if you can. Uh, do we play any of the games more than once off camera? Well, again, because I'm usually arriving, we're in a very packed schedule. Uh, no, I'm, I'm teaching them for the first time playing there. Normally, if I'm teaching, uh, then I will have played it more than once uh, before I get there to try to hopefully be able to give them a good presentation. I mean, that's an example there. My teaching skills on display because there I have no script. So I'm just sort of teaching off the cuff. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, yeah, sometimes I stay with them. Sometimes I have some other friends in Los Angeles that I often don't get to see. So uh, I'll sometimes stay with them when I'm in the area. Okay, one more question here. And then we'll get to Andrea. I'm sure Andrea has a torrential uh, downfall of questions she's just dying for me to get to because they're getting out of hand for her. So Ryan Bellinger asks, do you have a favorite tutorial video you've done? Oh, Ryan, I meant to like think about this before I read this question. And then I got behind bedazzling this shirt and I forgot. Oh, a favorite tutorial video. I mean, it's going to be, it's cliche to say Mansions of Madness because it was our first one, but that was a very special experience. I mean, I was figuring out a lot of things about what I wanted the channel to be at that point and, and how I wanted to present information. I was playing with my kids, which was super fun, and it was a game we all really liked. Um, and the, uh, the people we were playing with, the audience, and everyone was so lovely. I mean, that was a really special experience, and it kicked off, um, you know, to where we are today having this conversation. So it's kind of incredible in that way. Uh, and <laughs> to double down on it, returning to Mansions of Madness for the second edition, the second edition, which I think wildly and drastically improved the first edition. I would never go back to the first edition now. The second edition is, is like leaps and bounds better in my uh, I guess not so humble opinion, the way I'm expressing it, that I, I love being able to return to that game. And, and I, it's a game I still play today. Andrew was home after her graduation, and we, uh, I mean, we played, I don't know, we, we, we didn't play as many games of Mansions of Madness as we'd hoped to, but we played three or four, I think, and, and just had fun going back to like older scenarios and kind of working through the early ones that we hadn't played yet. So that was, that was really great. Well, guess what? I have gotten through all of the questions that have been waiting. Thank you for your patience. I'd like to jump into some of your questions that, that hopefully you people have been asking as well. Let me see if I can bring those up. So, okay, the first question from Jackie. Jackie would like to know, Rodney, what does your favorite, favorite COVID mask look like? Oh, oh shoot. If I'd known that was coming, I would have gone and grabbed it. But it's, you know, it's not just upstairs. It's like out in the car. 
it'd be ridiculous for me to go grab it. I'd be gone for too long. So it is, a, it's a, a nice black mask and it has a red maple leaf flag on it. I kind of like the red maple leaf flag. I, I kind of want the mask to symbolize in some way a little bit of like, ah, is patriotism what I'm trying to say? Like, hey, Canadians, we're all in this together. Uh, you know, it sucks that we have to wear masks when we didn't have to wear them before, but come on, let's, 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 let's beat this thing, you know? Until we can get a good quality vaccine, let's wear our masks and, and be careful for each other, right? So that's my, that's my favorite one. <laughs> Fudge Jin would like to know, Montreal or New York style bagels? I'm not sure if I've had a New York style bagel. Look, I, my palate is so stunted. I am such a boring eater. Anyone will tell you this. If, if I'm at a convention, speaking of conventions, when I go with my friends, like Marty Cannell from Rolling Dice to Take Names, Food, you think games are important at conventions? Friends are important at conventions? No, no, no. Food is the top priority for Marty at a convention. We'll get there, we'll, he'll see me, Rodney, we'll hug, he goes, where are we going to eat? That's the first thing out of his mouth. So lots of people have like very refined tastes and palate and I, I don't. I don't have like, here's a bagel, cut it in half, toast it, maybe put some butter on it, throw some peanut butter on there, throw some jelly, let's put some cheese on there today. Hmm. Let's put some honey. Want to throw a banana on there? Let's do it. I, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm a bore. For me, food is, is really a speed bump in my day. Some people really enjoy sitting down and enjoying a great meal. Whereas for me, it's like, let me just eat so I can get back to the stuff I need to be doing. That's, that's kind of what meals are for me. It's not to say I don't enjoy some meals, but that's by and large my approach to food. Amanda Panda, I think is asking me a leading question here, asks, what is your favorite animal? I guess you want me to say panda, wouldn't you? Amanda Panda, I think... My favorite animal, I guess, would have to be dogs. I know I have a cat. I know, and the cats, look, some of you know I have a cat. I have a, I have a vlog, which is not on my Watch It Play channel. It's on a different channel, uh, youtube.com slash Rodney J. Smith. I believe there's 50 episodes on there. Is that true, or is it 49? Well, we're going to get to 100. I haven't posted a vlog in forever, a dog's age, you might say, but I am going to get back to it because I am going to do 100 episodes. Just it's a busy time right now, uh, but I will get, get time again for that vlog. And, I, and if you've watched the vlog, you know I have a cat, which I don't know how to feel about that creature, but he's fine, I guess. But the, the, I love dogs. I love dogs. They're so loving. They, they, they act like they care about you. Cats don't do that, I'll tell you. The Funky Cat. What is your favorite genre of board game, card game? Favorite genre? Um, fantasy. I'm going to say fantasy, sort of the quick answer. I play lots of games that aren't fantasy, but if, if you're going to force me down one, I think fantasy provides so many opportunities. Like, you know, if you were to say, hey, what about like historical based games? I like those as well, but you're sort of left within the confines of human capabilities where fantasy or sci-fi even open up much bigger imaginations, right? You can sort of create something that's very realistic. Or you can create something that's very fantastical. And I, I like that. Jacob, unless by genre you meant style, like as in uh, card games or uh, deck builders or worker placement, if that's what you meant, then you might have to ask uh, the question again. Jacob C., how do you find the energy to play board games? I really enjoy the hobby, but full-time work is exhausting. <laughs> well, Jacob C., I suppose I find the energy because I never am able to play as many games as I would like to. And so that typically leaves me wanting more. Uh, the, the work with the show is, is very uh, time consuming, to be sure, in a good way. That's not a complaint. But it means that I don't get to play as many of the, especially the old favorites that I'd like to. And so I always kind of have that uh, thirst and hunger. I also have other hobbies, so that helps as well. Um, you know, and, and so I, I'll, I'll, I'll tinker with those other hobbies. And that keeps me from, I guess, burning out on board games. But I don't know. I've been doing this channel for, uh, it's since 2011. 2011. So you do the math, nine years, I guess. And I'm not tired of it yet. So I think this one's in my system and isn't going anywhere. Bill L. asks, will you ever have Tom Vassell on your show? You guys would be great together. A debate, maybe? <laughs> um, I would, it's just, first of all, yes, I would have Tom Vassell on the show. He very kindly invited me to be on the show in, was it, was it this year? Oh, no. I think it might have been this year. If you go to the Dice Tower channel and search under their videos and search for Watch It Play to Rodney Smith, I think you'll find uh, two or three of the videos that I was a part of. 
And I really enjoyed my experience. I really had a great time actually making those videos with them. We did a board game breakfast video together. And we did um, the top 10 enemies of gaming, which I thought was a really fun and interesting conversation to dig in with them. So would I, would I have him on the show? Certainly. Would I debate him? I don't know. Debate format's not really my thing. Now, don't get me wrong. Do I like to debate? Am I capable of debating? Certainly. Uh, but it's not where I get my enjoyment these days. I don't really have fun fighting with people over things. Now, are you, a good natured debate over something in the board game hobby, maybe, but I would much, find it much more satisfying to find an aspect of, of the hobby to explore with somebody else. It's kind of like what we did with the top 10 enemies of gaming. We each brought our own top 10 lists and we just discussed them. You know, we dug in and like things that they said I hadn't considered, things I said they maybe hadn't considered. And I, I like that kind of collection of ideas. I think there's kind of great growth that can happen there. Happen there. Not that there isn't a place for debate as well. But. So there, Bill, that's hopefully a good answer for you. Non-interesting name is the name of the person who asked the next question. What is your favorite war and tactics game? War and tactics. It's difficult because I don't always know what the person asking has in mind when they use certain ta uh, terms. War tactics game. Looking at my shelf, I'm going to say Twilight Struggle, uh, but I don't know if that's the type of game you have in mind. But Twilight Struggle is one of my favorite games, and it certainly fits that kind of Cold War, tactical, strategic style of game. I don't play as many war and tactic games, so I don't have the breadth of knowledge. I have, I'm looking over my shelf out of the corner of my eye there, you should probably see me look away. And I have a stack of four other games underneath of Twilight Struggle that I haven't played or haven't played in a long while that I'd like to get to, and that might, you know, <laughs> allow me to have a better answer, a more varied answer. Keegan Cole asks, any reprints you're really looking forward to? Uh, any games you hope get reprinted? No, uh, not really. I am, well look, I am interested in uh, Dark Tower coming from Restoration Games. I'm always curious about the games they reprint because I think they've done a pretty phenomenal job on all the games they've reprinted. But I don't, you know, I look at my shelf and I see a lot of games on there I'd be very happy to play right this minute. And I look at some of the shelves on my, to, to my work shelf, you know, like here's the games I'm working on videos for that I'd also like to get to and play. I feel like there's so many games. I spend very little of my time thinking about what's coming next because I know there's a giant wave of things coming next. Actually, one of the greatest sources for me of learning what's coming next is watching, and this is not meant to just be a plug for our own content, but the top 10 videos that Chaz and Paula and Matthew make on the channel, they list 10, we do three of these episodes a month looking at games from different perspectives. Games that we see is growing in popularity. Maybe there's some buzz circling around them. Games that are on our radar. These are things that kind of caught our eye. It doesn't mean that they aren't also popular out there with everyone else, but the things that we kind of feel like this really grabbed our attention. And then the underdogs is games that we think people aren't seeing that we also think are interesting. And Oftentimes, I'll find things on those lists I didn't know about that I go, wow, that's interesting. That's really like, that, that game looks cool. And it helps me kind of sift through everything. And then Matthew Jude does his Cult of the News where he goes through a bunch of games and announcements there often as well, as well as news in the hobby. And I find that to be a handy way of just getting enough information to satiate me. I don't, you know, it used to be I was like scouring every website. What, what are all the new releases? Because back then you could kind of keep up with all of them. <laughs> now I need them to be filtered for me. Alexandre Roberge writes, would you one day do a Chaz video and let Chaz do a tutorial? It would be funny. Alexandre, I definitely would do that. I would totally be up for it and uh, would enjoy doing it. Keep an eye out. Maybe that's something we, we will try. That, that might be a, a fun idea. Zane Emerson writes, what are your predictions for the future of board gaming and the board game industry? Ah, yes. Look into the future. <laughs> Well, I don't think we're in for bust anytime soon. That's been forecasted for a long time. First it was Kickstarter's gonna blow up and bust, and then it's the hobby's gonna, the industry's gonna blow up and bust. I don't think that's gonna happen. I think we are gonna see parts of the industry kind of blow up and bust, and I think it's gonna be predominantly around the way games are distributed and the way we buy games. And I don't know if it's all gonna be good uh, or all bad. It's hard to say. But I think the traditional models are changing. The traditional models being you're a publisher, you sell, you have a distri distributor come along who says, hey, publisher, you don't want to send, sell each individual copy of your game to each individual person who wants to buy it. You don't have the infrastructure to ship to each individual person. 
We do. We're big shippers. We got lots of space. We'll buy 10,000 copies of your game and then we'll sell them to stores and then those stores will sell them to people. You know, that's the traditional format and I think that we're seeing more and more successful publishers steering away from that or we see the larger publishers who have a lot of money, Asmodee for example, buying up some of those distributors so they had control more of the chain. So I don't know. I, I mean, I really, uh, I think we'll con continue to see uh, innovation and growth. Uh, by innovation, I mean new designers doing new and exciting things that we haven't seen before. Growth, I think, because more and more people discover that gaming is more diverse. It has more to offer. It's not just Monopoly and Risk. Nothing wrong with those games, but there's so much more. And I think we're going to see, hopefully, more diversity in the styles of designs, the look of games, the themes of games. They're going to draw in people to the hobby that never before thought the hobby was for them. And that is exciting to me. So I think we're going to see continued growth. Will it change because of COVID-19? Sure, I think it will. But I think it's, I, I don't have any predictions about what that kind of impact is. Is it going to drive more people to board games because we're staying at home and we want things to do besides just be on screens all day long? It could help the hobby in that way. But I don't know. I really don't know. Jim Jacobs, do you plan on doing a follow-up video with Dice Tower about your most anticipated games for this year? And also, on that note, I'd be curious, in the comments of this video, I'd be very curious to hear your predictions. I really would. I'd like to know what other people, because I get to ask this question. I don't think I have a genius answer for this question. If other people have their own thoughts around it, like, where's this hobby going? Where's the industry going? I'd love to hear what you think. So, Jim Jacobs, do you plan on doing a follow-up video with Dice Tower about your most anticipated games for this year? Um, there's no current plans. Would I consider it? Certainly. The biggest restriction would be time. Right now, I just don't have a lot of it. So my hope is sometime around November, my schedule should start to smooth out, get back to a certain kind of normal again. And then I'm going to have more time for some more extracurricular types of content that I really enjoy doing. I like being able to participate in other people's creative ventures, whether it's on their podcasts or YouTube shows and, and vice versa. So. I do hope so. Jesse Damon says, will you dye your hair pink to match Mandy? <laughs> Jesse, oh, I, I won't. Would I? I mean, would I? I would do it. The problem is, uh, I, <laughs> you know, publishers hire me to create tutorial videos for their games, and, and, and maybe a pink haircut wouldn't necessarily... Here's what I think would happen. It, for me, because I don't typically dye my hair, it would be a distraction. I really don't want, when I'm making a tutorial video, to be a distraction from the purpose of you being there, which is not to be checking, what is his crazy hair, or look at all the wild games behind him, or whatever. I really want to be that you can focus on the games being taught so you can learn it as efficiently as possible, and I would worry that doing something like that, which is a bit out of character for me, would be distracting, and would go against the purpose of, for example, the tutorial videos. But would I like to be able to do it? Sure. <laughs> it would be fun. I did dye my hair blonde once when I was in my teen years, I think I burnt all the pictures. M. Olson, with a person convent, with in-person conventions being a while away, what advice do you have to finding playtesters? Oh, M. Olson, that's I'm thankful that I don't have to find playtesters. I'm glad I'm not a designer because I would think that would be a, a really big challenge. Because I, I don't I don't have a lot of tips for you. It's not my area of expertise. Again, if I if I was a designer, I'd probably have more answers at my fingertips. But I think you've got to look in places like Board Game Geek. You've got to go where the gamers are. And I believe they do have forums for designers. And you go, look, I've got a game. I'm looking for playtesters. But I know for myself personally, if you wanted me to playtest your game, you've got to give me a reason to want to playtest. You've almost got to pitch me on it. You've got to make me go like, wow, look at this cool element. I think you've got to work on your sort of elevator pitch for your prototype. I think just coming in and going, I got a new design. Anyone want to playtest it? I don't know. A lot of people have a lot of games published games on their shelves they haven't played. So I think you'd, you gotta, you'd wanna like be able to self-market yourself pretty good, I think, to try to find those people who have an interest in, in playtesting for you. Jackie would like to know, will you continue with the wardrobe changes once you start going to conventions again? Well, I probably won't wear this shirt again, because I don't think, although, nope, another one fell off. These are staying on pretty good. Again, I'm not doing a lot of aggressive movement. <laughs> but uh, oh. I, I, I took a Mountie uniform with me to one of the conventions, and my bags were so stuffed coming back from that convention, I had to leave it behind, which was very sad. Uh, especially the hat. The hat was like, you know, a giant mounty hat, so I couldn't bring that with me. So, Jackie, will I continue with the wardrobe changes? Well, I promise you I will change my wardrobe each day at a convention. It just might not be cosplay or a costume. 
Jeremy R. Gill, do you have a favorite social deduction game? Werewolf, Avalon, etc. Yes, but it's been so long since I have played a social deduction game, I don't even know if I remember which one it would be. Resistance? Resistance was one of my favorite for a long time. And I really like Bang the Dice Game. I think that's another fantastic one. And I'm trying to think of it. Oh, what is it? Someone in the chat, you're going to know it. It's the one with the cops. Some are cops, some are criminals. There's guns on the table. It's not cash and guns. It's, it's uh, gosh, I cannot think of it. But some people are, are cops at the table. Some people are criminals. It's, uh, it's a pretty good one. Uh, I really like that one. It's got like super special powers and things you can use. Often comes down to like a pretty tense showdown. Oh, 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 oh. I know the answer. Sorry, I got the actual answer. Call of Cthulhu. Is that the name of it? <laughs> oh my gosh. Is it called Call? Hey, again, it's been so long since I played it. I'm sorry, I gotta go find it because I definitely don't want to get this one wrong. Don't mess with Cthulhu. Call of Cthulhu. Don't mess with Cthulhu. Don't mess with Cthulhu is my favorite deduction game by far. And I actually have a tutorial video for it. If you have not heard of this game, you may be like, I haven't heard about this. Can this be any good? It's really good. And it plays well with few, like four players. It's great. I played it a bunch of four players. That's how I fell in love with the game, was playing it four player. Another friend of mine, he was in love with the game. He played it. We played it with him, and it's like, this game is fantastic. So, Jeremy R. Gill, took me a while. <laughs> Don't mess with Cthulhu. That is the answer. Zane Emerson, what have been some of the hardest games to learn? Well, the easy one is uh, First Martians was probably the hardest, one of the hardest ones to learn. Easy to pick on First Martians. Poor Ignacy, I mean, he's had to hear about this forever, but the rule book just wasn't great. So it made it very difficult to learn. Stronghold 2nd Edition had similar problems. Not, not as bad, but also challenging. But every time I pick on Ignacy for those two rule books, I always have to throw him some praise because he's taken his rule book writing much more seriously. And I feel like the last few rule books they've put out have been fantastic. Rule book for Detective, the rule book for Detective Season 1, uh, Imperial Settlers, um, 51st State, what's the other one? Empires of the North. Fantastic rule books, really, really good. So, uh, yeah, th but those two were a couple of the hardest ones. I think any of the rule books that are war game rule books, I just, I find those challenging. I don't see the benefit of these 3.2.1, here's one rule, here's another rule, here's another rule. I understand the benefit of it once you know how to play and using it as a reference. It's phenomenal as a reference. But to learn it, you're just absorbing what I feel is a lot of abstract information and then you're trying to piece together what, what the flow of that looks like. I would much prefer to learn a war game as a narrative, where they teach it to you the way you would play it like most rule books do. First there's this phase, here's what you do in this phase, then you do this phase, here's what happens in that phase. You know, I, I'd rather have that, and then have, yes, that's when you do your dual rule book system. But give me a learn to play guide that's all of the rules, not just the ones you want to tell me about, all of them, and then also have a reference for later when I need to look up a spe specific rule I don't want to have to read through the narrative one trying to figure out where in the flow with that specific rule book. Give me a rules reference, I can bring it up here, find that ask section or whatever it is, and find the rule. Root came the closest. I've said that before, Root came the closest, I think, to almost perfecting it. I say almost because they did the dual rule book system and they put almost every rule in their learn to play guide except for a couple of really key ones that you're definitely going to encounter the first time you play. And if they'd only put those couple of rules in, I would have said, man, Perfect, perfect. But I think they'll keep perfecting it. I mean, they did a really great job. Given how complicated that system is, I can really only praise them. That's a, that's a minor nitpick. Zane Emerson, have you taken the Myers-Briggs test? If so, what's your personality type? I have taken it. I was very infatuated with the Myers-Briggs test in my 20s, and I was at the time an ENTJ. They typically say you, your personality type doesn't change. Uh, I don't know though. I think that certain aspects of my personality type and predominantly which way I lean on certain things has changed from that. But I'm definitely a J and a T <laughs> and an E. Okay, so maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and an N. No, I guess I am. Yeah, well, okay, there you go. <laughs> I just talked myself into my own argument. <laughs> there you go. So I think, yes, I think it fits. All right, I'm, wow, there was a lot of questions here. I gotta, I gotta pick up the pace if I'm gonna, gonna get through all of these. This is a Q&A and sparkles 
live show, so I am going to answer your questions. I'm going to try to stick through to the end. Michael Gallagos asks, at conventions when social distancing is over, would you consider, whoop, some of these are deleting because Andrew's deleting and cleaning up, which is great. <laughs> now I, I got to chase it. Okay. At conventions, when social distancing is over, would you consider doing game sessions that you offer seats for sale that the proceeds go to your favorite charity? Yeah, actually, if I was going to schedule gaming with people at conventions, that would be an ideal way to do it. The biggest challenge is it's very, I find it very difficult to schedule time at conventions. So that's what makes it hard. The time at a convention goes so quickly, so incredibly quickly. And there's so many things pulling you in various directions all the time at a convention. So it's like, oh no, I have to, at three o'clock, I have to be at this thing. So that means I can't do this thing at two o'clock that I really want to do because it's going to bump up against that three o'clock thing. Oh, there's a thing going on at four. Oh, I don't think I'll be done it by then. You know, I just, I like to go to conventions and not have too much on my schedule if possible. But I do like the idea of raising money for charity. And I do like the idea of being able to play with people who would want to play with me. And, uh, and a fundraiser type thing like that is a great way of doing it. Because then if you're pitching some money and you probably want to be playing a game with me. And uh, then we're raising some, some money for charity at the same time, which is, which is great. So certainly something I would consider. There's certain conventions that would be better than others. BGGCon, for example, would be a better convention for that than, say, a Gen Con. Adil Majid says, hey, Rodney, love your content. Well, thank you very much. Here's a question I have. How many games do you have in your collection? Do you purposefully try to limit it to a certain number? I am going to try to give you an up-to-the-date answer on that question by going to BGG because I do keep my entire collection in the BGG. Oh, darn it. I'm not signed in. Oh, it's working. Oh, no, it's not working. <laughs> really? <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to sign in. If I don't get it on the first attempt with this password, I will stop because no one wants to see I've had this problem before where I type in passwords when people are watching <laughs> and I get everyone yelling at me going, don't type your password in, we're all watching. Which of course is, no, that's not working. I, oh, shoot, shoot. I really would like to be able to give you a specific answer. Okay, I don't know. Without including expansions, it's somewhere north of 250, somewhere south of 325. I know that's quite a variance, but it's been a while since I specifically looked at that number, and sometimes I'm seeing the number with expansions and not. So I, I'm pretty, I mean, that's not a small amount of games, but I'm pretty strict about it. I don't want a balloon, ever ballooning collection of games. I've had more than that. I am working my way back down. I would like to keep a cap it at 365, because that logistically to me says, I'm already past what's sensible to own. If I had 365 games, there's no way in a single year I could play all the games I have. I probably couldn't even play half of them in that time. So why do I have these games if I'm not playing them except once every five years? Um, I don't really, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to create a museum here, right? I want to play a game so I can pull off the shelf and play. But like a lot of people, I do like having options. So it's a little fight. But I, the, the fight I'm trying to have is to not let it balloon. Question from Jesse Damon. Knowing that more gaming things are switching to online platforms, how do you prevent screen fatigue? I don't know. I'm a robot. I look at screens and I don't get fatigued. <laughs> I say that, although I have been noticing my vision has been changing lately. I guess that's a thing that happens as you get older. So that might be a little bit of screen fatigue kicking in. But uh, I don't really have a, I don't have a good answer to that one, Jesse. I really don't know. Um, I guess show up for the parts of the online convention you want to be there for and take breaks so you're not watching everything. Kabuki Kid, have you seen the Dune trailer? Are you excited at all? Okay, first of all, yes, I have seen it. Am I excited? Okay, honestly, no, but not because the trailer was bad in any way. There are so many people who are so excited for this movie and for a telling of this, excuse me, of this story. I don't really know the story. I've never read the books. I remember watching the David Lynch movie, falling asleep halfway through it, and not really understanding most of what I was seeing. That's pretty typical for a David Lynch movie, for that matter. But, and I like David Lynch a lot. But uh, yeah, so I don't have any strong connections to it. So, so I know for some people, like they're super excited. Like when the Marvel movies were coming out, I was super excited. If there was a movie series for the Foundation series by Isaac Asimov, I'd be really excited for that. You know, for this one, I don't know. I hope it's really cool. 
my friend Joel Eddy from Drive Through Games, he is over the moon excited for it. He was counting down the minutes before the trailer dropped. So <laughs> I just, I, I did see Tenet recently. Wow, I like that movie. I won't say anything about it, but I, li- I liked it. I hope, uh, hope if you see it on my recommendation that you enjoy it. Uh, Christopher Nolan movie, really good. Henry Whitehead, what is your favorite book or author? Well, uh, we, I was just mentioning Isaac Asimov of the Fa- Foundation series is very good. The Robot Detective series is excellent as well. So I think I would have to say that, although I, I definitely enjoyed Lord of the Rings growing up, but I think the Foundation series is one of the book series that really kind of made me go like, wow, what, what big ideas, what big thinking here. And I was fascinated by, by the whole series. It's, it's one of those things, I've never gone back and reread it again. I actually did read, reread the first book, Foundation, last year, but I haven't read through the whole series. Would it all hold up as well? I don't know, but my memories are very fond of it. The Burns family asks, any board card games that you feel could work well over Zoom, Skype, etc.? Well, I actually did a video for how to play Villainous over Skype, Zoom, or what have you. So that's a game that would work uh, if everyone had a copy of it. There's a lot of games that, w- that can work. Uh, even games like Marvel Champions could work. I think a lot of the times it comes down to how good is your rig? Can you get a camera position so that everyone can easily see what's going on on the table? If so, then great. If not, then you might need to stick to games that are a little more simple, like Just One. Just One's a a fantastic game. Another game, uh, Trophies, which is a game I featured on one of our live shows, is another very easy, just hold up a card, everyone shouts out an answer kind of game. Those are always always winners. Day Gulu says, are you ready for winter? Come on now, it's too soon to be talking about that. Canadians are always ready for winter at a moment's notice. So, sure, bring it on winter, I'm ready for you. Matt Hale, if possible, would you choose to survive via photosynthesis? No, I wouldn't choose to survive via photosynthesis. Although I guess maybe you're asking that in relationship to my, my relationship towards food, where I'd rather just absorb my nutrients. Look, I have a gross out tolerance as well. I don't want to have to lather food on myself to absorb it. So unless you're saying, you know, just the sun would power me, like Superman. No, because again... It's unpredictable. What if the weather's bad for... Like, we get a lot of cloudy days around here. So, no, I'll stick with the food. I'll just stick with just cramming bagels with honey and banana in my mouth when I get hungry. (laughs) Uh, Augusto Carulli asks, on which game do you and Chaz have very opposite opinions? Huh. That's an interesting question, Augusto. That's one that should be asked when he's here on the show. And after we've had a conversation about it. You know, Chaz and I are really good friends. But we don't play tons of games together. You know, a lot of my dearest friends in this hobby, I don't play games with. You know, except at conventions. And a lot of the times we're playing new games at conventions. So I haven't really had the experience of having weeks on end to to play games with my friends and discover, oh, you really like this game and I I don't like it at all. So very interesting question, but I I don't know where our differences are. I can't think of any that he loves that I dislike. There might be some I really enjoy that he doesn't that he would have an answer for. Mark Wilson, any new magic tricks in your repertoire besides the ever more impossible box flips, that is? Um, yes, uh, I, have, I have learned a few, few more magic tricks. But I'm very self-conscious about what I know about magic. I feel like a, a what's the word, a bit of a poser? I don't know. I'm, I'm not able to dedicate the time to it that I'd like to, to become uh, an expert in it, right? There are certainly some things I can do with some competency, but I would like to have, what is it Malcolm Gladwell says, uh, like 10,000 10, hours to become a master or to become proficient in something. I'd like to put in my 10,000 hours before I really start waving my magician's prowess around, which is really difficult because I do like performing magic. So um, I want the shortcuts, but the reality is it takes practice and time. But I will locally, when, when people come over, I will, uh, I will break out a magic trick or two from time to time. Zane Padella asks, do you think app-driven games are the future? I feel torn on if I like them or not. I feel like it gets rid of the timelessness of board games. Uh, I have no qualms whatsoever with apps in games at all. I know some people are dead set against it. If they see an app in a game, in a tutorial, they immediately have to bang into the comments, there's an app, I'm out. Which I don't, I don't know. I guess that's fine. But um, 
if something's not for you, there's no problem with that. If you play board games and you don't want another screen invading your playtime, that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, I don't think they're going to take over board gaming because we have video games for that. <laughs> but I think sometimes they can complement games in very unique ways. And I think Mansions of Madness is a perfect example of that. You know, here we have this house that I have no idea how it's going to look. It's going to unfold differently every time I play. Encounter is going to change every time I play. Yes, the app is there, and yes, I'm interacting with it. But compared to the amount of time I'm spending playing with the board game, it's barely there. And it's typically just there for one person, if anything. So I'm open to it. I don't think we're going to see a glut of these because, again, cost, money, and expense. But cost, money, and expense, did I just say the same thing three different ways? I sure did. Roy O, oh, what's the last thing you've painted? I haven't painted a miniature in a long time. The last thing was probably the miniatures for my war band for War Cry. I would like to get back to it. Fudgeon asks, will you do more tutorials of classic games like Risk, Clue, etc.? Why, in fact, I just bought Risk and Clue specifically for that purpose. So yes, yes, I do look forward to doing it. When I get a little bit of downtime from all the other games that I am uh, featuring, my plan is to do at least one more this year. That's my hope. Dave Zockvig writes, who do you think are some of the most innovative designers working today? Uh, Cole Worley, I would say, uh, is one of the most innovative working today. It's, it's challenging. There's a lot of great games, but the ones that strike us as innovative, you know, really different, bringing a unique mechanism into play, those can be hard to identify, at least for me. I, I haven't, I'm trying to think. Sometimes, you know, the games run together like a bit of a blur. I'm trying to think, is there anything I've played in the last little while that I would say was truly innovative, and who is that designer so I can give them kudos? And uh, I I don't know. Like I think Root and Vast, these games are very innovative and unique and different. And so the design team behind that game, I think, is, is being innovative right now. So sorry I don't have like a, 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 like a strong answer for that. You know, Forgotten Waters, I think, is actually a very innovative game. That was designed by, uh, well, there's a whole team of designers on that, Isaac Vega and uh, Joe and Bistro. And I think that, that did some very innovative things in the adventure genre. Okay, questions. Corlu, how often do you play games you have no intention, at least at the moment, of creating tutorials for? Not, not often, but it does happen. Um, so how can I give you a concrete answer? Once a month? <laughs> Maybe once a month I might. I mean, it's tough. It goes in waves. I've had some very busy months lately where it's, it's a, I'm doing more tutorials in a single month than I've ever done in the entire lifespan of the show. So I'm focused on those. But those games are games I want to play, the ones I'm working on for the show. Because I, I don't just do any game that comes along. Like if a publisher says, hey, will you make a tutorial video for a game? I don't just go, yeah, sure. <laughs> I, want to wa I want to want to do it. Because the tut tutorials take a lot of time. And I also make a point of answering every question on every video I've ever done. If I was answering questions on games that I didn't care for, that would suck, you know? And I didn't start doing this as a career to do something that would suck, right? So I make sure to pick games I have some affinity for so that I can then go on and support it for years and years and be proud and happy to do it, right? It doesn't mean that all games are created equal, that I love them all equally, but I have to like or admire something about them, you know? So uh, yeah, I, I have f f 15, I think I have 16 unplayed games in my collection right now, and the majority of those are games that I'm, I don't have plans to do a tutorial for, so. I'd love to get them all played by the end of the year, but I, I, the odds aren't great. All right, Anthony asks, my wife and I just finished watching all of your Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion videos and love the tutorials. Thank you so much, Anthony. That was a real, like, that was a real joy to do. I had never played Gloomhaven before, and I thought the Jaws of the Lion Gloomhaven game was such a brilliant entry into the game. It's still got tons packed into it, but it's not nearly as overwhelming as that gigantic Gloomhaven box. And I think it opens a door to people who, if they enjoy the Jaws of the Lion game, can then go off and, and dive right into that Gloomhaven giant experience. But I thought he created a wonderful sort of ramping up, and I was very happy to be able to try to recreate that ramping up experience in the tutorial video. So very excited to, to have been able to work on that one. Any two-player game suggestions for some newer board games? Wow, so if, if you're new to board games and you jumped in with Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, I mean, that's not exactly the deep end, but it's, it, it is the deep end. I mean, let's, let's face it, there's a lot of rules there. So kudos for jumping in like that. Um, 
Nothing wrong with starting slower, though. One of my favorite games is Carcassonne. That's one of the games that brought me into the hobby uh, after I'd been away from it for a while. And I was like, wow, this is a really cool, fun, tactile, strategic, thinky game with a very simple subset of rules on the, for the most part. So I'd highly recommend Carcassonne if you haven't played that. It's going to be hard for me not to recommend Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition because it's just a personal favorite of mine. As I look over at my shelf, are there any other ones that might jump out at me? Fog of Love is an interesting game. I mean, I have a, both a tutorial video and a full playthrough of that game if you'd like to see it in action. It's really interesting where you play, you and your partner play partners, people who are trying to uh, start a relationship together. But you're not meant to be play acting as yourself. You're creating different identities for yourselves and then you're meant to play act those characters' particular motivations. It's a fascinating and innovative design. There's an innovative design right there for you. Coralou, when you do the box flip, why is every game always put back into the same spot on the shelf? <laughs> well, I wish I had a clever answer for you, Coralou, but the reality is that's kind of the best view of the shelves right there. And it's also the easiest place for me to pull a game off the shelf and give it that lovely little box twirl. So that's, that's where I like to, <laughs> like to put that. I, it's to make it easier on myself, all right? I don't make everything easy on myself. Look at what I'm wearing right now, right? But that aspect of it, I do try to make a little easier on myself. Burns Family Question. Ever had a game that has good reviews, but because of, but because of the theme and art, you just couldn't appreciate it. I passed on Secret Hitler, though logically I can separate my appreciation of games from theme in most cases. It's funny, that's a game I also kind of struggle with for probably the similar reasons. Um, and, you know, it's, it's difficult to apply that uh, consistently because I have other games that deal with war and World War II, and arguably they're connected to Hitler in some way. But um, I don't know, sometimes you just know when you know what makes you feel comfortable and not comfortable. And I don't, I don't judge too harshly when people's boundaries are different than mine. It just depends on how far different they are, I suppose. But I can't think, oh, you know, um, Kingdom Death Monster. That was a game that really turned me off uh, just in terms of the aesthetic. I felt like it was a lot of, uh, especially in some of the promo stuff, a lot of uh, male gaze driven artwork and models. Again, I'm not overly judgy if that's your thing. It's just that doesn't appeal to me so much. All right, Pete Willings. Uh, there was a Reddit post saying Scythe was a modern Catan the other day and the author was heavily criticized for it. What do you think about this comparison? I remember seeing that post. I didn't dive in too deeply. I think it was there was a video, right? Um, I hate hearing that. Heavily criticized for it. Okay, so an individual had a personal opinion about a game and said, I think this game has a lot of comparisons to this other game. This is their personal opinion. And I have no doubt there's a lot of people who took great, uh, you know, great delight in telling that person why they were so wrong um, and how at the lunch they were. I, I, that's the kind of debating I have no interest in. I don't, on the one hand, I don't care that he thinks it's like Catan. That's cool. It's cool that he makes that comparison. I, whether I do or don't, it's great that he has that opinion. But I certainly, if I had a different opinion, would not get invested in trying to tell him how wrong he is. There are certain things, there are certain opinions I think worth fighting over. What you like in games, what you don't like in games, what game reminds you of another game, what game got rated this when you think it should be rated that. I have zero interest in <laughs> any of those conversations, which I think sometimes makes me a bad uh, guest in certain kinds of conversations because a lot of people get a great deal of enjoyment out of arguing over which game is better than another game. And I go, who cares? <laughs> like, I really don't. It's great if you like that game. If you like some game and I don't like it or vice versa, that's wonderful. We never have to play that game together. We can play a different one that we both like. I don't know. Some people care just a little too deeply about their subjective opinions about entertainment. You know, there's subjective opinions about things in life that really matter that I wish people cared a little more about. Um, not board games. Okay, uh, Meeple Medley. What is one of your favorite games that you and your wife like to play together? Two-player game or good at two players? 
Maple Medley, you asked me that question. I had this on my BGG list. I'm sorry, I think I must have lost that when I was transferring them over to the little anime graphics. So I'm glad you asked this. And we've got 10 minutes left in this live show, or less, because we're running a little long here. Uh, but I really wanted to get through all your questions. I think I am getting to the end. What is one of your, okay. So uh, Christian and I really like uh, Fox in the Forest, awesome. We enjoyed Fox in the Forest duet, but I think we won both times the first time we played it, like the easy mode and then like the harder mode. So it didn't, you know, it didn't make us not like the game, but it, we weren't as drawn to going back to it as we were the head-to-head uh, -head version of the game. Viticulture is another game we enjoy playing together. One of my favorite two-player games is Watergate, and I don't think I've played that with her, uh, but I really, 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 really like that game. And she and I uh, and the kids have been playing The Crew, which is a trick-taking game. Another trick-taking game that we really enjoy is Tichu. Uh, when I go to my in-laws, so her parents, we play that all the time, multiple times, and really enjoy it. Digliuz, what is your favorite Canada-themed game? <laughs> Canada -themed game? Is there a Canada-themed game? I'm always tickled when I'm playing a game and some amount of Canada is showing on it. Usually, you know, it's the U.S., uh, or some other country, understandably so. But um, no, I don't, I can't, I mean, there's Timeline Canada. I featured that here on the live show one time. I'm looking at my shelves. Do I have a Canada themed game? <sighs> I don't think, I don't, I, I, if I'm forgetting an obvious one, then someone slap me. Last question here Shorty Dancer. Any plans for more vlogs? I miss Elvis. Elvis is the cat. Yes, there are plans for more vlogs. In fact, I have content shot. Uh, I just need the time to sort of stitch it together in some kind of logical way. And I'm, look, you know, there's a lot of people who are really uh, hurting right now because of the impact that COVID has had on their working situation. I am so thankful, I am so grateful that I've been able to keep working. And probably some of that uncertainty, you know, that we're in right now has driven me to be all the more focused towards the work aspects of the show. I don't regret that. But it means it's keeping me from other things. So that when I do have downtime from Watch It Played, my inclination isn't to go pick up another camera and start shooting something else. It's typically to try to fit some time in with my family, play a game with them, maybe crack into a magic book or, or do something else that way. So I think, I think we've sort of gotten to the end of the questions here, I believe. Now I'm going to take a quick look at... The live chat here, Keith would like to know, are these candies on my shirt? No, you'll have to go back to the earlier part of the stream to learn, to learn what these are, Keith. They're not candies. I will not be eating them later. But you know what? We are, I think we're at a good point here to sign off. I want to thank everyone once again for joining me for another It's Live live show. This one was very straightforward. Normally, I do try to have maybe a game we play or some other antics that we get up to. But this time, I was really feeling like, Sometimes we get to the end of these live shows and we haven't had the conversation, the back and forth that we sometimes have. And I wanted to dedicate an episode to really do that, really dig in, get through some of these other questions. Oh, actually, there is, Jackie sent me some other questions and I usually have some fun with Jackie and the fun I like to have is not answering her questions. But since I'm in such a good mood, I will answer these questions too. Jackie asked me this, she said, what would you do if you took a week off from work? I realize you have to use your imagination for this one, but I have faith in you. If What I would do if I was taking a week off from work is I would try to get together with my family and go somewhere on a little uh, mini vacation or a hike. Again, being very careful about where we go and being uh, conscious about COVID. We sort of have a bubble here. We're fortunate. We now have some cases here on the island. For a long time, we had none. We now have a few. There are people who are traveling outside the bubble, but they're contained. So we're pretty fortunate. We're relatively safe here. But I would take with me on that trip games I haven't played that I don't need to play for the channel. I would take with me uh, books, lots of books that I have. I have books by my bedside table, and that shelf of books, uh, it's like a shelf now, stack, has been growing. Because I'm not getting through them at all, but I keep saying, oh, I'd like to read that book too, and I'm adding books to that stack. So I take a bunch of books to try to read through, and I take a bunch of magic tricks to practice. So I can get in those 10,000 hours so I can more competently perform for people. Also, how much money would we have to raise for your charities for you and Chaz to get Mohawks Live? Again, the problem with doing things with my hair <laughs> is that I don't think I could do a tutorial again until all my hair grew back in. It would be just too much of a distraction. So there is, I would, I would have to be retiring from the channel 
or taking like a good month long break, then we could talk about it. If that ever happens, Jackie, we will we'll talk about maybe giving me a mohawk. <laughs> okay. And finally, she says, given that Halloween is coming up, isn't it really time to decide whether ghosts are undead? Oh, that's a great callback. When we were doing uh, the live streaming from Spiel with BGG, me and uh, a couple other fellas got into quite a conversation about whether or not ghosts are undead. I actually have the footage from that conversation that I intended to edit together at some point for some fun. Haven't done it yet. It's on the stack of things to do, but that conversation will probably come up again. All right, I, I think now I've gotten through all the que questions, I believe. Thank you everyone once again for joining another It's Live Live show, for submitting your questions, for spending this time with me. You can be doing lots of other things. I love that you wanted to spend a little bit with me. I really enjoyed spending it with you. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and try to have some fun, try to play some games. Stay safe out there, wear those masks. You know, I want all of you to stay safe. And of course, I'll see you online in other videos. We have another tutorial releasing tomorrow. A little spoiler for you, it's Tiny Epic Dinosaurs. And my goodness, that game impressed me. You know, it, was, it, it had some really clever mechanisms in it. And again, these Tiny Epic games, they pack a lot of game in a little box. And I think this is one you might want to check out. And then this Friday, we have Cult of the News with Matthew Jude, a whole bunch of really, <laughs> some more wacky and fun board game news for you to check out. Be sure to check out that episode. It's, it's uh, well, it's gonna be a good one. And uh, otherwise, of course, we'll have just more and more videos for you and more live shows, hopefully, in the future. But until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>